I'd like to introduce you to my dear friend Lucy Cavendish who's a natural witch and a well-respected author in Australia and throughout her writing and throughout her life experience um, Lucy has written a little bit about indigo crystal and rainbow children and I'd like to interview her and ask her a few questions about her own experiences growing up and what it's like now for her as a parent. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Lucy. I guess thinking about children and childhood, growing up for me was wonderful in lots of ways because I had parents who were really connected to the outdoors. You know, our whole life was spent outdoors and it was incredibly natural how we did everything. Um, nowadays people talk about you know living a healthy lifestyle or getting more healthy or becoming more spiritual and I think it was just really innate in my family because we spent so much time either in the bush or at the beach or just eating really well. Everything felt very balanced within my family and my, my parents are really grounded. So I'm very grateful for that because I think it helped with being a highly sensitive kid to have parents who gave me really natural ways to calm myself and to feel free and to physically express myself. Um, I think sometimes now a lot of that stuff is made to be like homework, you know, and in fact it's really simple, but there's an even bigger disconnect, um, you know, some, some 40 years later. Uh, than there was, you know, growing up in the 60s and 70s. How would you describe your experiences um, as a sensitive child? What kinds of ways did you experience spirit from a young age? I always sort of, I guess as a young person, I always felt like maybe I hadn't been born with quite the same amount of layers on my skin <laughs> or something as other people because I seemed to feel things really deeply and seemed to become either upset by things more easily than other people or feel and see things that maybe other people weren't aware of um, or could sense undertones to conversations, you know, precognitive dreams, all that kind of stuff. But I, I always remember thinking that maybe there was just something wrong with me, um, that perhaps I should toughen up or be stronger. Um, not cry so much, uh, all those sorts of things, and it, it was, it was, it wasn't always easy. I think my parents understood to a degree, but didn't really understand because they were post-war people, and post-war people had grown up during a time when stoicism was the great philosophy. You know, just toughening up, sucking mm -hmm. things up because worse things had happened to other people, and um, you had, I think, this, this these sort of new people coming through who were more sensitive, who were uh, beginning to express subtleties in feelings and talk about the, the importance of emotion and that was going to be our role and then our connection to spirit was going to be our role. But as young people growing up with stoic parents, it could be really difficult because we, we weren't what they would call tough. I still think people who are highly sensitive are strong and can be tough and are very courageous. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion around these terms sometimes. Being highly sensitive doesn't mean that you're weak. It was interpreted as weak. Are there any ways that you can um, relate to this in terms of being a parent yourself yeah, now? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, you know, my, my daughter is a person who is extremely passionate and cares a great deal about justice and yet at the same time with all this strength and, and fire that she seems to have she's you know she's a really sensitive young young woman and so are many of her friends um, there's a high degree of creative young people coming through there's a high degree of young people who care deeply about what they perceive as social injustice and the environment and, and how the world works and they're full of questions and it's a little bit almost like you know there was a big group of people born in the late 50s early 60s i believe um and there were you know like the flower children in the late 60s early 70s and i almost feel like there's a new group of 
children coming through now who, who are hitting their teens and I haven't got a label for them but what I observe from them is that they care a great deal about um, equality in terms of gender and same-sex marriage and they feel really strongly about people being able to love who, who they love. Um, they want to be able to make a living in creative and meaningful ways and they want to take care of the planet and they're almost like activists you know there's they're, they're, they're flower children who are activists and they're highly highly creative is what I'm seeing as well there's this incredible talent um, being born into the world now do you have any tips for <laughs> parents and teachers <laughs> who say might have sensitive children in their care or in their household? Oh. Look, I'm going to empathise with them first of all because it can be challenging. Um, I, I'm a highly sensitive person, my daughter's a highly sensitive person. For, for people around us, I can understand that it's challenging sometimes and they, there can be this sense of, oh, I don't want to upset them but I don't want to work on eggshells. You know, we're all working at becoming more authentic, real and honest. But around highly sensitive people, how do you do that without upsetting them? So it's about context and how things are expressed. I think highly sensitive people can handle the truth, <laughs> um, can take the truth, um, but it's about having their own perspective on it. So I think respect is hugely important. Um, I think there used to be a kind of disrespect for emotional people. Um, particularly in Anglo-centric cultures, um, you know, which Australia is kind of coming out of now, but it really firmly held to that stiff upper lip thing for a long time. I think respect is the way to approach it, that simply because someone has a different um, way of expressing themselves, or is tearful perhaps, or who is um, more fragile in some respects, doesn't mean that they're weak people. So I think your job is to nurture their strength and their confidence, but in real things, in, in, in things that they really can do. Um, it concerns me sometimes that parents tell their children that you can do anything and be everything that you ever want to be, because sometimes that's not exactly true. Um, I, I think it's important that we encourage them to expand their potential and really go for their dreams and be creative. Um, but at the same time to nurture the talents that they have that are unique to them. And that's the point of discovery for every parent and every true teacher is to find what is this child or person really talented at? What, are they, what do they really love and how can I support them in finding a way to express that thing that they really love and are naturally very good at rather than everyone wanting to be on Australian Idol or The Voice. <laughs> you know, to, to find some kind of validation as a creative, talented person. There's got to be more room for all the unique forms of talent and creativity um, that are out there. And I think nurturing your child's individuality is one of the first steps and respecting their sensitivity. As a person who is quite um, sensitive and experiencing um, experiencing your spiritual gifts from a young age. Um, if you think about the children today, um, would you have any tips for any parents or would-be parents mm. about this? You know, the funniest thing is I've had quite a few parents come to me over the years and say, oh, I think my child is really sensitive and really gifted and I think they might be an avatar and I really want to get them into um, exploring their psychic talents really early. I think that's wonderful. But remember to instill ethics and values in your child as well. So when someone has come to me and said, I think my, my child is an avatar, I've said, yeah, but you know, it's a bit like, you know, chop wood, carry water. You know, do the work, um, teach your child to be respectful, grateful, um, to work with the family, but also find ways where they can develop their, their innate psychic or spiritual abilities and I think that comes in a way from l observing rather than telling you know I, I with I guess with kids I know I, I observe and I see what they may be naturally drawn to and then I might offer a book or I might say you know you, you could try 
meditation or you could try um, focusing, you know, see where their talents lie, see whether they're, they're clear feeling or, or whether they're clairvoyant and you know, just sort of see what's going on for them and then give them exercises that will help develop that. And you can't do an exercise to expand someone's clairvoyance without it having a really broad range of applications. I, I really think it will assist people at school and I think it will assist them with their study. So, you know, whether they go on to be a pilot or a doctor or something that isn't traditionally associated with these sorts of skills, every little bit of um, intuition and spiritual connection will assist them. No matter what we need spiritually or aware and awake people in all professions so that the world changes rather than everybody wanting to become a, 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 a psychic as their job description. Do you see what I'm saying? That you know this should be a part of development yeah, and a natural part of development because it is a natural part of us and I think we're coming into a time where we have these fantastic parents who are seeing how they can incorporate it holistically um, into their children's lives. It's something really natural. It's not something other. And I think that's wonderful because then the kids won't feel strange about their talents. Do you have any other closing comments? Look, I think the most important thing is if your child is displaying any kind of abilities and, you know, often when, when your child is young, it, that may come in the form of disturbances, for example, sleep disturbances or seeing people who when they describe them, you may feel a little bit cautious about who's around them. So one of the, one of the most basic things to teach them um, are ways of protecting themselves and clearing energy so that their energy is always integrous. Um, and I say that because there's many, many kids who are talented and, and have this shining bright energy do attract entities that can feed off them. Now I'm not saying that to scare anybody, it's just the truth, you know, these entities are hungry and opportunistic. So take the time to teach your children how to be safe, but don't teach them to be frightened because these things are quite easily managed. And that's what I would really encourage everyone to do. And you'll find that you then develop a child who feels really um, able to manage their gifts and able to manage energies around them without becoming scared. And if you become scared, it just gives other entities and so forth an opportunity to feed even more of them. So in increase their confidence and, and the sense that this is natural. It's not strange, it's natural. Thank you for your time, Lucy. My absolute pleasure, Nathan. Okay, blessings to you. <laughs> blessings to you too.